crazy. Are you going tree hugging or bulldozer hugging? We're shooting a rally. They're gonna shoot you and bury the bodies. Well, then you can watch my execution because we're gonna be streaming the whole thing. I'm so watching that. This sounds insane. I know what you're thinking. What kind of sick bastard could watch the Green Inferno and think it's not disturbing enough? Well, I'll tell you. Let's not forget, this was directed by Eli Roth, the guy best known for Cabin Fever, a movie about a flesh-eating virus that doesn't shy away from it, and my personal favorite, Hostel, a movie about torture. If you've seen any of these movies and you're a fan, you would think a movie about cannibalism would fit perfectly into his catalog. Especially after stating that Cannibal Holocaust, a film so graphic they had to make sure the cast was not killed for real, was one of his top five favorite movies. Unfortunately, The Green Inferno doesn't even come close to reaching the same level of, well, anything. It received negative reviews, and I can't say I'm surprised, but I think the best way to describe it would be mainstream. Is this a joke? Now, I don't mean that in a family movie kind of way. Obviously, the film is quite violent and disturbing, but to Eli Roth's standards at the time, it doesn't even come close. Compare this to something like Hostel, that's not only disturbing, but also very dark in its tone, and, well, there's no comparison. That was a film that knew what it wanted to be, and you better damn well be prepared if you decide to watch it. Not to mention, it was actually well written. The Green Inferno isn't awful in terms of writing, it's just not that interesting. As far as violent content that you've come to expect from Eli Roth, there's not that much of it. I'd go as far to say that there's just one real violent scene. Not trying to say the movie's tame from that point on, I'm just saying it's not embracing it. I know this makes no sense considering the movie's reputation, so let's just analyze The Green Inferno so I can properly explain myself. We open with an anonymous tribe of some sort, and bulldozers bulldozing the land, because why not? We then see protesters, um, protesting, and our lead characters, the soon-to-be Eli Roth's wife Justine, who, get this, seems to kind of agree with it despite her roommate Casey having a different opinion. The only thing those posers care about is looking like they care. It's just a mere demonstration to appease their fucking white, stupid, suburban Jewish guilt. Fair enough. A uh, fact is, she's probably the only entertaining character in the movie. It's too bad she's not in most of it. But it's actually time for what might be the most disturbing thing in the movie. The discussion of female genitalia mutilation. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now, but keep in mind this is an Eli Roth movie, so if you're not okay with seeing that kind of thing, then maybe quit watching? Maybe? If you're okay with the subject matter, then perhaps this could lead to a tense scene in the third act. A concept to keep in mind for later. But her commenting on this gets the attention of Jonah from the activist change team, in which she's not particularly interested, but he promises there is no pressure. Don't think. Act. Uh, where the fuck did that change in tone come from? It's almost like he's just a plot device. Kind of like her dad, who doesn't say anything that interesting, apart from the fact that she previously took flute lessons, which we all know has to mean something eventually. So let's just get to the next scene, the meeting which she does go to, in which they discuss how a jungle in the Peruvian Amazon will be bulldozed for a reason you'll never guess. The companies want the natural gas in the ground under the villages, so they GPS the location bulldoze the homes, and kill the natives. Ah, natural gas, who would have seen that coming? What a standout concept. But despite coming there, she outright insults the leader, Alejandro, and is asked to leave, only to apologize the next day. We need people who are serious about making an impact, not making jokes. Again, it was more of an insult, but whatever. He tells her that the only way to get anything done is to organize a group, head down there, and utilize social media. 
Right or wrong, you in cameras on them. That's the only way people change their behavior. The threat of embarrassment. You must shame them. Aha, another new concept. Well, not by today's standards. So she joins them, and they devise a plan to do, well, essentially just that. Be careful. Jungle's a dangerous place. What are they trying to tell us with this scene? Something bad gonna happen? Well, what do you want me to say? I think you're 100% wrong. I think you're 100% whore. And thus ends the best part of the movie. At least the pacing was okay. They meet up with Carlos, the guy who's quote-unquote making the dream a reality, obviously not suspicious, and head off to Peru in a tiny riggedy plane. Are you okay? Yeah, thanks. Small planes always make me nervous. I feel like we're gonna crash. <laughs> you know what I think? Something bad is gonna happen. Isn't it weird that that's the guy who's paying for everything? He's wealthy and he supports our cause. Just because he's Latin and wealthy doesn't mean he's a drug dealer. A uh, suspense. Who needs it? After a bit of sightseeing, it's pointed out that the whole thing could possibly end in disaster, and the phones are their only defense. I mean, they do have guns, that's made quite apparent, but I guess there's no reason to actually use them. Because phones are better. They ahead think that the Black Jaguar is the guardian of nature. They also think that it carries sinners to hell. Good thing he's on our side. Okay, okay, there's no way that fucking Jaguar is gonna do anything in the movie to imply that it's on your side. It's fucking ridiculous. Anyway, it's time to finally commence the operation, chaining themselves to the trees and demanding the bulldozers quit bulldozing while sending it live to social media. Ah, so much for phones being the best weapon. But what's this? It turns out Justine's lock is broken, and it was all part of the plan. Because now that her lock's broken, it's much more likely that they'll kill her in front of everybody with the cameras on. What? That's fucking stupid! What does her being unchained have to do with anything? Also, did they even consider the fact that she might not be okay with this and eventually tell someone? So, they obviously don't kill her, but they do get arrested. Luckily, bribery is a thing, and they get back into their small, riggedy plane and celebrate a job well done. Apart from Justine, who isn't quite as stoked on the situation, that is until looking down at the amazing feat of what they've accomplished. Well, it's 40 minutes in, what the hell do you expect? So they crash land, and a couple of noticeable people die, like Carlos and this really stupid man. And the cannibalistic tribe shows up, killing more of them and taking the rest captive. But the important thing is, we've finally gotten to this point of the movie, about halfway in, and I can finally discuss one of the film's key issues. See, while most of them are placed in a cage, Jonah, the most likable character, is tied down and very brutally killed. I'm talking eyes ripped out, tongue cut off, hands and legs removed, only then to be followed by decapitation. It's an incredibly violent scene, obviously made more painful intentionally, and it's most likely the point when a lot of people left the theater if they didn't want to see more of this. And if you're one of those people, I don't know what you expected, but also, you really fucked up. Because there is no other scene in the movie that gets close to this level of brutality. This is disturbing, you want to look away kind of stuff, and it never happens again, at least not to this extent. I mean, there's stuff worse than the average horror movie, I'll give it that, but this is Eli Roth, and from this point on, the movie's fucking tame. If you enjoyed this scene, then you're gonna to want to quit watching because only disappointment awaits. And no, that's not my only problem with the movie, but we'll get to that in a minute, because for now, we got some plot development. 
It turns out they didn't stop shit, and the whole thing was a fucking photo shoot. There's simply too much money in the ground to stop this, but because of their new popularity, they can now make real change, um, sometime in the near future. It's good news. If he's telling the truth, then those bulldozers will tear these motherfuckers to shreds. Yes, let's make sure everybody knows what's gonna happen. And then there's this. Be thankful that they killed Jonah first. He can feed them for a week. That's another problem with this movie. There's way too many jokes you wouldn't be making in this horrific situation that they're trying to downplay for some reason. Now I know this guy's supposed to be a dick so I can kind of let this one slide, but it's not the last we're gonna see of this kind of thing. But for now, they may not have to wait for help as they've devised an escape plan. <laughs> Shocking. And now we have the other thing about this movie I can't stand. Fucking cliche bullshit. In this case, the fucking kid who she attempts to befriend using her necklace flute thing which we knew would eventually be relevant, but if this kid has anything to do with the climax, that's it. But for now, we have one of the last decent scenes in the movie, and no, I don't mean that in a sick, disturbing way. This movie did, very early on, bring up the topic of genital mutilation, so you can't really expect that concept not to get brought up again. And believe me, this is an uncomfortably tense scene that you'd expect from an Eli Roth film. Especially after Justine is knocked out and taken away. You don't know what the hell is gonna happen. The idea of her becoming one of them and eventually doing the same thing to the others is a possibility. You just don't know, and that's the kind of thing you want from a movie like this. Unfortunately, this kind of feeling is not gonna last much longer. But for now, they devise a new plan to distract the only guard watching in the whole area, so Samantha can escape to the nearest boat and bring back help. And meanwhile, Justine is brought back with no memory of what happened, but at least they are finally given food. I'm vegan. You know, fun fact about vegans, it's not just a health deal. No, vegans tend to take their beliefs very seriously, to the point in which on popular Food Network programs, they'll primarily not use foods that go against their beliefs, even if it hinders their chance of winning. However, upon seeing your friend chopped into tiny bits, you might not take that belief quite as seriously. But what do I know? Anyway, guess what? It turns out the other girl didn't make it, and her skin has been utilized as a bull decoration, resulting in her committing suicide. Okay, don't take this the wrong way, but how can you go from the previous death to this? One being off screen, and the other just committing suicide? I mean, it's pretty violent stuff, but compared to what we just saw, it's nothing. If you're still watching, you're probably bored by this. And you know what else? I liked it when being a female didn't mean an easy death in an Eli Roth movie. Equality both ways. Real suspense. But I guess that's sexist now or something. They devise a new plan to stick weed down her dead body in an attempt to drug them. And then Alejandro masturbates. No, I'm not kidding, this happens, I don't know why it happens, it continues to happen as the other guy tries to choke him out of anger, and you know, let's just move on. The plan to drug everyone is successful, I don't think it would be, I mean, did they all eat her at once? I guess it's supposed to be in the air, but is it really that potent? But Alejandro doesn't have any faith in this plan and stabs Lars, ensuring he won't die next. But on the bright side, at least we have a kind of scary scene. <laughs> oh, <see? laughs> this is not a funny situation, you know. Fuck, they have the munchies! Fuck, they have the munchies! That's right, that's exactly what you would say if a group of cannibals was standing right over you. 
What the fuck? What the fuck were they thinking with this? The movie Hostel didn't have anything like this. It was dark, gritty, terrifying, atmospheric. What would you expect from that kind of situation? But this? May as well just say... If you don't eat your meat, you can't have any pudding! How can you have any pudding if you don't eat your meat? So they eat him, and yeah, it is a real violent scene, but still nothing compared to the last one. I mean, it's a movie about cannibals, it's not gonna stand out too much. But at least the other two got out. Well, who would have seen that coming? Okay, we have one disposable character left. Something extremely gruesome has to happen. Ah, here we go. Finally, what the fans want to see, and they cut away. That's right, an actual interesting way of killing somebody, and we don't even get to see it in favor of that genital mutilation thing that at this point we know isn't gonna happen. There is nothing remotely tense about this scene because you know somehow she'll get out of it. <laughs> Do I even need to say... Isn't that convenient? Yep, the forest cleaning crew arrives in the nick of time. And the fucking kid helps her escape. It's too fucking convenient. But it's not over yet, as they pursue her, and there's even that jaguar from earlier blocking her path. But they decide not to shoot her because the jaguar's there, and it decides not to attack her. So yeah, that's... that's it. That was anticlimactic. So she gets rescued and opts to lie about anybody else being there. But you think they check. I mean, they have the upper hand and she could be lying. Kind of like how she lies about the whole thing. Saying they're a peaceful tribe and they only try to help. I'm sure Jonah would appreciate that one. Followed by a dream sequence when Alejandro makes it back and she bites him with terrible CGI and it makes no sense in the grand scheme of anything. And we have a mid credit scene implying Alejandro has become the new chief. But who gives a fuck because they don't think a sequel's ever happening. That was the Green Inferno. What a complete mess. The best way to sum it up is below average. The storyline's not that good, it's way too predictable, and I say this in proper context, it's not that disturbing. I mean, it is, but not even close to what you'd expect. And after the first initial death, it never again gets even close to that level. As mentioned earlier, it's kind of like Eli Roth trying to be mainstream. I know that sounds odd, but that's what it is. Not only do we have a lot of cutaway deaths and not that much violence overall, but the way the characters act is just not realistic. I mean, they make jokes when they're seconds away from a violent death. Who the fuck would do that? How can I take this seriously? How can I take any of this seriously? By the time you get to the end, you know nothing's gonna happen, so you just don't give a fuck. I know the lead's gonna make it out. I know the rest are gonna perish. And I knew that from the moment when one of them brought up being vegan. If you think I'm wrong for thinking that way, that's fine. But aside from all this, even if you haven't seen Eli Roth's previous films, it's still not that good. And despite not seeing Cannibal Holocaust, I'll bet you it doesn't have a scene when some guy jacks off while being strangled. I'm the analyst, and remember kids, genital mutilation is wrong, and if you think it isn't wrong because of some heritage thing, then you're fucking sick. I mean that. It's not a joke. So, you made it to the end, an impressive feat indeed. Since you managed that, consider checking out the gaming channel, in which I cover a variety of gaming topics, like in-depth gameplay, and analysis videos like this one. If you want to see that, then press the link in the description. It's that simple.